Hello friends, your host, Billy Dean Shoemate III here, and welcome back to another episode of Strange Places. Yeah, before we get into it, you see the title? S3E73. It is the first episode of the third season. Yeah, we're in the third season of Strange Places. Man, this is crazy. <laughs> I never... I never thought that um, lightning would strike twice in the same place that I have. You know, I have another podcast that's, well, now, as of today, in its sixth season. And that podcast made me one of the very few people who, uh, less than 10%, actually, of podcasters actually make money doing this. And I thought, you know, chances are just astronomical that this was going to happen again. This podcast is doing better than my other one. <laughs> And I couldn't be happier. I uh, extremely blessed that you keep coming back every week. And this podcast is uh, as listenable and as uh, apparently entertaining as it is. I, I I wouldn't have done it without you guys. And I, I really appreciate that. We're in our third season, man. How cool. I'm just, I'm beside myself. I This started off as an experiment. And when, you know. <laughs> you fall off your toilet and that image that you drew of the flux capacitor while you were in your days actually ends up being something that changes your life. You're kind of not ready for it. And I wasn't ready for it. I know I'm getting personal here. I'm getting deep, right? But I got to tell you, it is changing my life. Uh, that coupled with another podcast that's hugely successful. It's actually making money doing this stuff. Um, I'm being noticed in two different realms now two different shelves you know because my po other podcast is about something completely different so i'm gonna i'm gonna quit rambling i'm just very thankful and i appreciate all of you so what are we doing for this momentous episode well i was gonna do the tunguska event this is one of those uber famous ones one of the ones on my short list this is one that you cannot run any kind of um paranormal study show or podcast or talk show or anything like that without talking about this. It was an approximately 12 megaton explosion that occurred near the Tunguska River. It's now in uh, Cry, Russia. On the morning of June 30th, 1908, the explosion over the sparsely populated eastern Siberian region flattened an estimated 80 million trees over an area of about 830 square miles of forest. Eyewitness reports suggest that it, uh, at least three people may have died during the event. The explosion is generally attributed to a meteor air burst. The atmospheric explosion of a stony asteroid about uh, 160 to 200 feet in size. The asteroid approached the uh, east-southwest, so they say, and likely with a relatively high speed of about 60,000 miles an hour. It's classified as an impact event, officially. Even though no impact crater has been found, the object is thought to have disintegrated at an altitude of 5 to 10 kilometers without any kind of debris from said asteroid or meteor ever being found. The Tunguska event... And I... Did you hear my snarkiness there a little bit? Okay. The Tunguska event is the largest impact event in recorded history. Recorded history. Though much larger impacts have occurred in prehistoric times. I mean, an explosion of this magnitude would be capable of destroying a huge metropolitan area. It's been mentioned numerous times in popular culture, inspired real-world discussion of asteroid impact avoidance, and a matter of fact, it's one of the things that they study when our powers that be look into asteroid deflection. So, a little bit of background. June 30th, 1908, right? Before the implementation of the Soviet calendar, so technically, <laughs> according to them, it was the 17th of June at around 7.17 a.m. Natives and Russian settlers in the hills northwest of Lake uh, Baikal, uh, yeah, Baikal, observed a bluish light, nearly as bright as the sun, moving across the sky and leaving a thin trail. Closer to the horizon, there was a flash producing a billowing cloud followed by a pillar of fire that cast a red light on the landscape. The pillar split in two and faded, turning to black. About ten minutes later, there was a sound similar to artillery fire. And what's weird is, when I looked at that, 
almost everybody who knew the sound of heavy artillery fire said that's exactly what it sounded like, like identical to that, which is pretty odd. Eyewitnesses closer to the explosion reported that the source of the sound moved from east to the north of them. The sounds were accompanied by a shockwave that knocked people off their feet, broke windows hundreds of kilometers away. The explosion registered at seismic stations all across Europe and Asia. The airwaves from the blast were detected in Germany, Denmark, Croatia, UK, even as far as away as Bariava, Dutch, uh, Indies, even here in the U.S., it's estimated that in some places the resulting shockwave was equivalent to an earthquake measuring 5.0 on the Richter. Wow. Over the next few days, night skies in Asia and Europe were aglow. That's odd. That's weird. I didn't notice that in my initial research. Huh. See, this is why I do this. <laughs> this is why I save a lot of the research for when we're rolling. I don't know about you, but when I listen to shows like this, I like natural reactions so you, to where you, I can hear, uh, I can physically hear the gears turning in the host's head. You know, it's, it, I, I'm entertained by that. I hope you guys are. Um, what was I getting at? <laughs> yeah, it created weird glows in the skies afterwards. There are reports I'm seeing of brightly lit photographs being successfully taken at midnight without the aid of flash bulbs in Sweden and Scotland that far away. It's been theorized that this sustained glowing effect was due to light passing through high altitude ice particles that had formed at extremely low temperatures as a result of the explosion. Uh, it's, you could actually reproduce it by uh, using space shuttles. In the U.S., a Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory program at Mount Wilson in California, they observed a months-long decrease in atmospheric transparency consistent with an increase in suspended dust particles. Did you get any of that? I didn't either. So what, you know, they usually say <laughs> when stuff like this happens, anything from the miracle at Fatima to the Tunguska explosion, ice particles in the air. Okay. They like that one, don't they? I'm just saying it may be. <laughs> I'm not denouncing it. You know, we use our common sense here. It may be. I just think it's funny they always use that. Eyewitness reports. I tend not to pay too close attention to these because, like I said, your brain is not a perfect, uh, what else word I'm looking for? Your brain is not the perfect machine to recall really anything. It's susceptible to so much outside stimuli. I don't even think that firsthand report should be used in court. I, I really don't. Unless you're dealing with someone who is an expert in that field, number one, or someone who is trained to observe. Because our brains are just, they're really bad at you know, interpreting and storing information. You know, half of your memories are stuff that your brain just fills in, right? You know that. But there's one thing in these eyewitness reports that kind of bothers me. Everybody at least at a certain distance, said this thing sounded just like artillery fire. And there were a couple of them that swore something was being shot at. Something was being fired. One person said cannons. Another one said heavy artillery. One, you know, These are all people who had some kind of military background. They know what artillery fire sounds like, yes. They know what explosions sound like, yes. And they all say, no, this sounded exactly like artillery fire. That's something that's rarely, if ever, mentioned when people talk about the Tunguska event. That's never mentioned. I think the only time that eyewitness reports in my brain are even halfway legitimate is when they're from an expert, someone who's observed to, either trained to observe, period, you know, to observe and report. This is why I think police officers, they do count. And experts in a certain field. These guys are from the military. They know what artillery fire sounds like. Granted, yes, they've never heard a meteor crash to Earth. <laughs> they've never heard a geological you know, event like that or a celestial event, you know, something crashing into Earth. But this gives us more. Um, so, uh, this makes me want to ignore all of the other ones. Like completely. I do not consider eyewitness reports much at all. But this is pretty significant, this one. So I'm going to kind of filter out the other eyewitness reports. So we're going to stick with this one, the people in the military. 
No, I'm being open here, okay? <laughs> I'm saying, no, these guys have guys and gals have never heard anything crashing to Earth and exploding, you know, from uh, interstellar space. But this gives us a good jumping-off point. Since the 1908 event, there's been an estimated 1,000 scholarly papers, most in Russia, published about the Tunguska explosion. Owing to the remoteness of the site and the limited instrumentation available at the time... Modern scientific interpretations of its cause and magnitude have relied chiefly on damage assessments, geological studies. These were conducted years after the event because of the remoteness, the crazy weather, all that. But estimates of its energy have ranged for anywhere from 3 to 30 megatons of TNT. It wasn't until more than a decade after this that any scientific analysis of the region took place, in part due to the isolation, political upheaval, that was a big one. They never visited the central blast area initially. And they found out why <laughs> later. Let me look up something. Uh, okay, I wanted to locate something in particular because I know this is going to come up. I know it's going to come up. I just want to have it ready. <laughs> okay. All right, there we go. I knew it was coming. Trust me, when we get into this, it's going to freak you out. There is a theory out there, okay? But I'm going to, I'm going to save it. I'm going to save it for right now. <laughs> because if I just jump into it, you're going to be like, okay, Billy has completely lost his mind. So there were expeditions sent to the area 50s, 1950s, 1960s. They found microscopic ciliate and magnetite spheres and siftings of the soil. Similar spheres were predicted to exist in the fallen trees. They couldn't find any in the trees, which is odd, but they found it in the soil. Now, these are found, uh, you know, high proportions of nickel relative to iron, which is also found in meteorites. And that's what everybody uses in terms of saying, you know, this is definitely a meteorite because the nickel content of the stuff that they found in the soil. Use your common sense, man. That's what I just, I want to shake some of these people. Yeah, you found it in the soil, and that's exactly what's found in meteorites, yes. But that concentration isn't only found in meteorites, man. It's not. And on top of that, the this, uh, this just bothers me. This concentration of nickel is not only found in meteorites. It's like they always stop there. And here's the other thing. Here's the kicker. This is the second thing I was getting at. This stuff was only found in the soil. It wasn't even found in the pitted, potholed, destroyed trees. What does that tell you? I don't know. <laughs> but it does not tell me meteorite. That stuff would be everywhere. And we don't have to go back, you know, gazillions of years to prove the point. We have craters right now we can go study. I mean, when that meteor explodes, man, that debris gets absolutely everywhere. You find it miles away. And yes, you find it in trees. There's nothing in the trees here. None of that strange concentration of nickel, silicate, magnetite. Meteors aren't the only places that this stuff comes from. So that means that, that kind of points toward maybe not a meteor to me. Because it would be in the trees and it's not. Everybody just ignores that. Bugs me. Numerous anomalies were considered consistent with an impact event, though. The isotopic signatures of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen at the layer of the bogs in that area correspond to, an, uh, you know, 1908. They were found to be inconsistent with ratios measured in the adjacent layer. So what that means is that there's, there's a really high proportion of things that are supposed to be in, like, Cretaceous-era rock. <laughs> These unusual proportions are believed to result from debris from a falling body that deposited into the bogs that it created some kind of massive crater that went down to like Cretaceous era rock. But there is no crater. So how are they finding stuff that's inconsistent with, the, with certain rock levels when there was no crater, when that Cretaceous era rock was not exposed? They think that it could be acid rain, a suspected fallout from the explosion. That acid rain being far more acidic, <laughs> far more 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It uh, dissolves everything it touches. Far more dense than water that it could potentially trickle down to or soak down to Cretaceous era rock. Scientists disagree, though. Some papers report that hydrogen, carbogen, carbogen, <laughs> hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen isotopic compositions with signatures similar to those, blah, 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 blah. There's always an argument. But uh, I'm not saying that scientific terms always mean bullshit. But when somebody overdoes it, <laughs> overdoes the lack of layman, it sounds like, oh, most people aren't going to get what the hell I'm saying anyway. Right. If you really had something on your hands, you would go as layman as possible. You want to tell the world, you know. So what these other people are saying is that it couldn't be acid rain. It couldn't be this. People are arguing this back, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I don't know about you, but common sense tells me. I tend to go with the guy who has the explanation other than just a group of big words. That, that's just me. Maybe I'm an idiot. So they've been uh, studying the peat bogs. In 2013, a team of researchers published the results of an analysis of microsamples from a peat bog, and they actually looked in the freaking trees near the center of the affected area, which shows fragments that may be of extraterrestrial origin. Now, I'm not crying UFO. I mean extraterrestrial as in interstellar space. There's Earth impactor models, blast patterns. Is it an asteroid? Is it a comet? Geophysical hypotheses. There's a lot of those, too. Though scientific consensus is that the Tunguska explosion was caused by the impact of an asteroid, meteor, either or, there are some dissenters. There are people that say this was caused by the release of the subsequent explosion of 10 million tons of natural gas from within the Earth's crust. The basic idea is that natural gas leaked out of the crust and then rose to its equal density height in the atmosphere. From there, drifted back down, kind of like a wick effect, which eventually found an ignition source such as lightning. Man, <laughs> once the gas was ignited, the fire streaked along the wick and then down the source of the leak into the ground, whereupon there was an explosion. I'm not buying that at all. I'm looking at a model for that right now. That's an awfully cute explanation, but this bugs me because you need too much to happen. You need an extremely high amount of, I mean, almost unnatural amount of natural gas in a concentrated area. You need atmospheric effects to work properly. I mean, this does happen, the wick effect, but it's never made an explosion even remotely as big as the Tunguska event. I mean, this is, if this is not a once in a lifetime thing, uh, this is extremely unlikely. In fact, astronomical. I'm not really buying the wick effect natural gas thing. You could have, you could have 10 times the amount of natural. See, he says it requires 10 million tons. Come on. Based on like every model that I've read, except his, you need at least triple that. So is this guy saying 10 million because this is just a number that he liked or he saw that it was triple that and he's like, ooh, I better take it down to 10 million? Or was his math incorrect? I don't care because all three explanations tell me that this answer doesn't hold up. Natural gas effect? Sorry, not buying it. They say it's an airburst. A smaller one did occur over a populated area in, back in 2013 in the uh, Ural district of Russia. Remember, like there were a lot of uh, cell phone videos and stuff coming out of Russia, people driving and seeing that meteoroid. It was determined to have been an asteroid measured about 56 feet across. It was a lot bigger than you think. It had an estimated initial mass of 11,000 11, tons. It exploded with a 500 kiloton energy release. This thing injured 1,200 people, broken glass for miles when its shockwave hit, but it exploded in the atmosphere. That's another thing. There was no crater. There's no impact craters everywhere. They do find a couple of potholy areas throughout the surrounding like peak bogs and stuff. But this thing should have left a massive crater. Even the, uh, even the natural gas idea. It would have left a sinkhole. <laughs> We've seen these things happen before. 
when these natural gas explosions happen, we do see effects in the ground. There is nothing with the Tunguska event. Let me tell you something else that's weird. All of these trees that were absolutely flattened, 80, 800, oh, sorry, 80 million trees. Wow, coffee. 80 million trees completely flattened, okay? But the epicenter, do you know what they, you know what they found at what would have been the center of the Tunguska event? Absolutely healthy trees. Nothing wrong with them. Not flattened, not burned, not irradiated. There's no radiation at the Tunguska event, you know, in that area, by the way. Never has been. Which, you know, some people say that's what points to uh, asteroid or meteor. But the trees in the middle, at the epicenter, this isn't difficult to find out where fucking ground zero was for the Tunguska event. This isn't difficult shit. It exploded in a circular pattern. Just go to the middle. It's like the water ripple effect. People are making this way more complicated than it needs to be. The center was not fucking difficult to find. And you have scientists that are saying, oh, they looked in the wrong spot in the wrong spot. Give me a break. Yeah, this place was very remote, but the devastation was immense. And in the area, the trees are perfectly healthy. Dude. So what do we find outside of the circle? We find something eh, kind of strange. There were tops of trees sheared off for about a mile leading up to the outer perimeter of the blast. You know, So let's say you have the blast area on the very outer ridge of it. You have about a mile in a straight line of trees with the tops sheared off. Which indicates to me, you know, something fell from the sky. There's no crater. So they say this thing probably exploded in the atmosphere. Okay, so I start doing my research here. This thing would have had to explode about five miles up for it to have not left a crater. Now think about that. I pulled some brains together on this one. One of them being my friend Stephen. I'm not just out of privacy. I'm not going to tell you his last name. My friend Stephen is kind of a mentor of mine. He has a master's degree. Uh, he's a chemist. Works at a battery factory. He has a master's degree in chemistry. His wife has a master's degree in mathematics. So I got them together on this. <laughs> and we determined that based on the eyewitness accounts. Now, I, I'm saying I'm going back to eyewitness accounts, but I'm ignoring all the other ones. The military eyewitness accounts, people from the military, because I think they're the only ones that have, that we, we should even take into consideration. They said this thing all, you know, was like careening towards the horizon. This thing didn't blow up five miles up. This thing hit the ground. That's what they said. This thing hit the ground. We have to consider what they say. Because these people are military. They are trained to observe. They know what artillery fire sounds like. This is a first-hand account that we need to pay attention to. So this thing did not explode. You know, in order to not leave a crater, okay, the size of the thing that it was, the trajectory in which it was going, the atmospheric effects, my friends and I concluded that this thing would have had to explode five miles up in order to leave no trace on the ground. That's not what these people are saying. And, you know, you think to yourself, okay, it might have been the debris, right? Some of the debris caused this, and this thing was pretty much vaporized in the atmosphere. No, <laughs> this explosion was caused, uh, the math doesn't line up unless you use math for the entire unit. You know what I mean? I can't rip a chunk off of it and then have this kind of explosion. It should have been a hell of a lot smaller. We, according for the, for the math to work, we have to use a 200 foot diameter piece of rock for this to work. A chunk did not break off. So considering that the math is not lining up properly, I have to rule out meteor. We have to rule it out. Now, what are we left with? Well, there's another story. The one that I told you, if I had jumped into right away, you're going to think I'd lost my fucking mind. <laughs> the magnitude of the blast was thousands of times greater than the nuclear bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Its impact was felt as far afield as here. 
Had it occurred just minutes later, it would have destroyed the whole of St. Petersburg and killed millions of people if it was a meteor, which uh, I am willing to say at this point, it's obviously not. Use your common sense. It wasn't a damn meteor. It became apparent, you know, something momentous happened in Tunguska. There's another theory here. I'm going to say his name, and you guys, you're either going to roll your eyes or you're going to scoot closer to your speaker. <laughs> Nikola Tesla. Yeah. One of the alternative theories about Tunguska revolves around Nikola Tesla himself. Tesla was a scientific genius. He needs no introduction. Credited with several important innovations, electricity, magnetism, radio, for many years, he explored ideas for the wireless transmission of electricity. In 1901, he started construction on the uh, Wardenclyffe Tower in New York, ostensibly for tele you know, uh, telegraphy. He used the tower to further his experiments into the transmission of electricity. This was about, about time of Nikola Tesla's apparent downfall. Some people think he bit off a little bit more than he could chew with this thing. Some think that it was Marconi that was really beaten down, you know, breathing down his neck. And some people were saying that Nikola Tesla, and this is according to some biographers, around this time, Nikola Tesla had a complete nervous breakdown and wouldn't tell anybody why. By 1906, his financial backer, J.P. Morgan, they were dissatisfied with his experiments, or so they say. They withdrew funding. Tesla was spending too much money and taking too long. This doesn't have anything to say with how much of a genius he was or wasn't. It's just that, you know, people like Marconi weren't as good, but they could produce. And that's all that they ever really cared about. Now, I mentioned the... Um, a nervous breakdown, because this may have something to do with it. It's been suggested that Tesla tried to salvage his work at Wardenclyffe and receive his fortunes by staging an audacious publicity stunt. This is what they're saying. Tesla had become convinced his wireless electricity transmitter could be used as a weapon, able to transmit an electrical wave through the earth of such intensity that it could destroy a target hundreds of miles away. And he was admittedly working on something like this. He hated the, the words death ray, so he, did, he uh, opted the term peace ray and never really caught on. <laughs> but yeah, he talked about this. Like the rest of America, Tesla was gripped by the exploits of Robert Peary. If you don't know who Robert Peary is, he was the first guy to uh, really assault the North Pole. And he landed there successfully. Why are we talking about Robert Peary? Nikola Tesla was uh, enamored with this guy. He was one of his heroes. But the reason I mention him is because at the time of the Tunguska blast in 1908, Peary was camped out at Ellesmere Island in preparation for his bid to reach the North, North Pole, which he eventually did. But he was receiving word from Nikola Tesla. And he even told Peary before he left that he said, hey, Nikola Tesla told him, and this is documented. Peary not only wrote this, but this was heard by other people before Peary left. And Tesla would even send him, you know, communications, however he could to get to Peary. Hey, if you see something weird, if you see any kind of signals, huh? Let me know. And he said Tesla kind of had that uh, little boyish grin of his when he said it. Tesla was up to something. And that's exactly what he told Peary. Hey, if you notice anything weird out there, let me know, huh? What better way for Tesla to demonstrate the awesome power of his devices than fire a bolt of energy towards Ellesmere and rip up some ice, cause a light show, right? That would have saved him. Advocates of the theory that Tesla was behind the Tunguska blast claims his publicity stunt went terribly wrong. His concentrated wave of electricity overshooting its target and caused the explosion in Tunguska. Could Tesla really have done this? This one deserves to be looked into because this is very compelling very compelling this is pretty strange tesla himself gave rise to much of the speculation by repeatedly claiming his electricity transmission device could be used as an energy weapon he talked about this a lot he said i could destroy men or machines approaching within a radius of 200 miles now, people are saying, oh, uh, this is probably why the FBI and the CIA took all of his, uh, yeah, confiscated all of his stuff. No, that's not true. They didn't confiscate anything of Tesla's until after his death. 
Yes, the circumstances surrounding that are a bit odious and odd, but no, this did not happen around the time of the Tunguska event. Tesla was well in his grave when they confiscated everything. Unusual prolonged lights in the sky, both before and for days after the impact, mind you. Even as far afield as England, the sky was lit up for days, and people kept seeing what they described as orbs in the sky. Most of the eyewitnesses said the earth was shaking even before the explosion. Tesla described how this, and these are the military people, these are the only ones we're paying attention to. Tesla described how his advice, if it worked, theoretically, it would, due to atmospheric effects and stuff like that, and the energy distribution, it would actually shake the ground first. The meteorite theory is undermined by the fact that no blast crater or trace of any meteorite was found. So people are really saying... This might have something to do with Tesla's energy weapon. There's something that bugs me about this one, too. Tesla was not... And I'm going to go a little bit over time here because we're at 30 minutes. It won't be much longer. I just... I got a point. Tesla, he spent... When he was staying at the New Yorker, this was well after his downfall. No money, not a penny to his name, no funding, nothing. He would rescue these pigeons... And he would spend the last of his thousands of dollars nursing injured pigeons back to help that he found in the park. He was actually kicked out of the New Yorker hotel because of the amount of pigeons he had in there. It was known that Tesla had a very deep respect for not not just human life, but life itself. And just the prospect of building a death ray. He said that that was something theoretically that he could do. And he often kind of talked about it in a boastful manner but even tesla himself said this is probably something i'm never going to build i'm not in the business of building weapons i'm in the business of making life easier making life better for people i'm not going to create any any weapon of mass destruction here i'm not going to do it but he talked about it a lot he's one of those guys like you know if i wanted to yeah i can make something that'll nuke a continent (laughs) he was just one of those cats point is This is a guy who had nothing, just a couple thousand dollars left to his name. Westinghouse would eventually swoop in and pay for Tesla, you know, just to avoid the bad press. And look what they did to your golden boy and look where he's living. Just to avoid that, you know, Westinghouse eventually swooped in and paid for his living expenses for the rest of his life. But before that, when Tesla was living off of pretty much the money in his freaking pocket, He was nursing injured birds back to health and shit. You know what I mean? His respect for life was, it it was there and it was real. Now, a lot of people find something very, very strange that when the Tunguska event occurred, as in that fucking day, Tesla seemed to have a complete emotional breakdown. He was inconsolable. And this is one of the things that either led to his downfall or it was a result of his downfall. There's no way to prove which one it is because he never told anybody why he was suffering such an extreme amount of depression all of a sudden that just happened to coincide with the Tunguska event. Is it possible that Tesla sank into a state of depression because his ray missed and he thought maybe it could have hit a populated area or even those, you know, minor considering, considering how big the explosion is, only 12 people dying. I mean, that would have seemed like a million to him. But imagine being responsible for 12 deaths. That that really messed him up. Or it could have been everything was starting to crumble around him by this point anyway. And he just didn't want to talk about it. Could it be that that depression was caused by... Him missing his target, killing 12 people and destroying how much forest? (laughs) All of it? Could be. But this is, uh, this is something, this seems a little irresponsible, even for a desperate Nikola Tesla. I know men do some pretty crazy things out of desperation. Pretty crazy things out of desperation. But this is a stretch even for Tesla. And his, his, you know, he finds a guy who uh, is super famous at the time. The guy who's going to the North Pole, you know, everybody's going to be watching his every move. Everything this guy reports is going to be read in books for decades, centuries even. So Tesla picks this guy and be like, you know what? If I can show him 
that such and such thing works. Oh, man, he's going to come back and report. Yeah, it's a cool idea, and it's very Tesla. <laughs> but firing a death ray just to get that publicity back, even for desperation, that doesn't sound very Tesla to me. Getting depressed because something, your death ray missed and you ended up hurting people, that sounds very Tesla. But we don't know for sure. There's no way to prove it. All we know is that before this North Pole Explorer left, Robert Peary, Tesla said, hey, you notice anything weird? And he said it in kind of a cheeky little kitty brat way that Tesla did, you know. They could tell he was excited about something. Hey, you see anything weird? You let me know, huh? But then this Tunguska explosion happened. This is in Russia. Is it, poss is it possible that he could have missed? Tesla is not the kind of guy. <laughs> I'm just straight up telling you. Tesla is not the kind of guy that would put a decimal point in the wrong place and miss when it comes to something that destructive. Tesla isn't even the kind of guy that would have even built something like that, even out of desperation. But then again, I can't argue with this either. Desperation is a stinky cologne, boy. And it will seep into your pores. Desperation to make you do some crazy stuff. Even throw your morals out the window. Did it happen? Can't prove it. Is it possible? I'm going to say you bet your ass. Now the UFO angle. I know we're going over, but this is one, this is a really, really big one. And th 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 this one has a lot packed in there. <laughs> a lot. People go the UFO angle. Was this caused by a crash UFO? I'm no extraterrestrial engineer. Okay. <laughs> but every single, every single instance of a crash that we've heard about, UFO crash, UFO landing, any time that we have a legitimate, provable story that a UFO either touched, landed here on Earth, or crashed, what do we see? 100% percent of the time radiation 100 percent of the time the ones that we can prove and be like yes ufo did crash or land here 100 percent of the time there is radiation in that area zero at tunguska what does that tell you no ufo <laughs> no government black project no ufo it's just not there People were not seeing that they saw a ship careening to Earth. They said they saw a rock. It was mentioned by three of the military people. Out of the seven eyewitness reports from former military and active military at the time, they all said rock. Rock, 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 rock. That's what it was, a rock. But we know it wasn't a rock. Was it a comet? No, a comet would have been fried on entry. They saw... A rocky mass fall from the sky. It sheared off the tops of trees. Could it have been some kind of black project or UFO that doesn't emit radiation? Well, if it is, it would have been the first one in freaking history. Was it a meteor? Was it an asteroid? No, it was not. But I do believe that it was some natural kind of event. Based on the eyewitness reports that we can really give a shit about... I wish we could have gone the natural gas angle because that would have wrapped this whole thing up in a nice bow. But no, this came from the sky. I do think, in my heart of hearts, I do think that this was something entirely natural. And I think that it's one of those cases. This is why we still talk about the Tunguska event. I think it's one of those cases that... The conditions were absolutely astronomically perfect to leave no crater, no this or no that. But what I keep going back to is the fucking trees in the middle, man. That throws that that throws everything out of whack. I've seen pictures of them. How do you explain that? You can't. That sounds more realistic concerning Tesla's Tesla's death ray than, you know, some kind of rocky mass falling to Earth. This goes without saying that the Tunguska event requires further study. Man, I really wish I could have 
proven or disproven anything on this one, but unfortunately, the Tunguska event will remain as mysterious as it ever was before the show. So, <laughs> what do you guys think, huh? What are your theories? Do you have any? Did I miss some crucial piece of evidence that could have blown this whole thing wide apart? Let me know. Go on Asylum817.com. That's Asylum817.com for all things Strange Places related. All the social media links are there, as well as a link to get to our Patreon account, where you can get everything from bonus episodes, giveaways of certain tiers, all kinds of crap. Check it out. Shout out to the patrons, by the way. The Kunkel Homestead YouTube channel, Donald Haynes, David Peterson. I appreciate you guys. The show would not be around if it wasn't for you. I'm serious. So, yeah, that is all I got. I will catch you later, everybody. Have a good one. Thanks for coming back. First episode of the third season. Again, I'm just beside myself. I'm going to go celebrate. Maybe you should, too. Have a drink on me or something. Anyway, that's all we got. Are we ever going to run out of strange places to talk about? I don't think so. Because every town has a strange place, and maybe one day, we'll visit yours. <laughs>